I feel like there was something I wanted to talk about, but I forgot. Ironic, considering the other thing I wanted to talk about. Not right now, though. It feels well, like maybe. For what happened last race, and just surviving feels like a victory at the jet level, so mm. I'm happy to knock it out. It's the best I've ever felt after a night. I'm gonna, make a, I'm gonna make a deck real quick before continuing the story thing. Because uh, it'll be really boring if I just use the same decks that Perfect. I have made over and over. Every week. Wanna mix things up. Looking good. Oh, right, I remember now. Well, I'm gonna write it down just in case, but I'm gonna talk about it right now anyway. I was watching some, I was watching some drum covers of Genshin's OST by 8-Bit Drummer again. And, uh, I got to thinking about this lady. Who are you? Are you canon? Are you part of the lore? Are Primos actually part of the lore? Okay, Is Honkai canon in Genshin and vice versa? Why did they have to put a weird old lady person thing? For the Welkin? I can't, man. I just can't. I can't so much, I actually started speaking in a British accent. I'm gonna stop saying can't like that, because it kind of sounds like a certain word, a no-no word. Long-awaited weekends, finally. I'm doing my Toho dailies. I don't think I loaded into the fucking what the fuck, fucking fuck, fuck, hell, fuck, shit. Apparently when it comes to saying... The body parts of the human species pertaining to the genital area are a no-no. But when it comes to speaking such foul-mouthed words like that, I hold no reservation. Hell yeah. Dang it, I forgot the auto-rematch. Uh, 
This realm is... Let me do that. I like this song, so I'll stay for now. I don't think the monster's deck is working out. I'm gonna delete it. It's too impractical. But the Decide my deck around this time, pray tell. I'm all for work life balance, but I think this is pushing it. Really, I gotta do 100 battles. I'm gonna rather than go for the event. I don't oh, care about the event points or stuff. I'm gonna go to chapter two, act two. And farm for witches got dreams. I can farm for XP like this. Hmm. I'm feeling Mona. I don't give Mona enough love. Make a deck centered around Mona this time around. Oh, oops! I'm in full auto. Enough procrastinating. Let's go. Okay, I almost got double. I got used to snap. So, garbage. Honest. Alright, let me just do a manual I mean, uh, a lot using this team. work-life balance, but I think this is pushing it. Almost got hit by the max. Yes! I'm gonna survive. Oh, that was such a tough race. Such a tough race in 7. Chelly, I want to pair with Mona for sure with someone that can deal a lot of big damage. Wow. Final six. Quickly, preferably. Tired from years, I forgot it existed. I remember how great it was on 100. Alright, final six. Alright. 
start with the Sixer out. Bocciatino got the dream track here. Great track for Sixer. Very playable in 200cc. Starting in first place. Track. In adventuring, yeah. as in business, you always have to seize the opportunity burn while it's there. Burn to all targets, Maurice is immune to burn. Dang it, color. Oh, actually Life balance, but I think this is pushing it. Goldening. Great words, Troy. There you go. Save us a replay. Now we auto rematch. Wait, what about replays? Come on, enough procrastinating. It's a full auto rematch. It's a full auto rematch. That's stupid. God damn it! Well, I gotta wait for the battle to end. Go for a freeze cop. I think that's a solid choice. Like literally, you can't go wrong with her. She deals good damage all around. She can be the DPS and then I can have Shang Lang. This seems like a good idea. I start with Mona and I spread the Hydro. And depending on what I think benefits me, I'll either switch to Ayakan Freeze or Goba. And get some melts and vaporizes as this is in. I'm all for work life balance, but I think this is pushing it. I think Ayaka is actually the best choice to start off with, though. Since Mona can't deal any damage. Yeah, 
it's not really all that useful and it costs too much. My Ayak is just too busted. Now put him on and lift. Tail end. There we go. There really aren't any other characters like Ayaka <laughs> who are so cheap and easy to use. So quickly too. I guess there's Sino. And Yoimiya. And uh, Yoimiya is still a bit clunky. Enough procrastinating. Let's go. This really isn't worth it. I'll go for these, though. In adventuring, as in business, you always have to seize the opportunity well, I guess while it's the there. only damage dealer is. I don't think it's worth wasting card slots. Life balance, but I think this is pushing it. Hmm. I don't have any healing. Energy. Come on, enough procrastinating. Let's go. In adventuring, as in business, you always have to seize the opportunity while it's there. Can you shut up for one second, touching. Worth 
I really don't see the point in using this. I'm all for work-life balance, but I think this is pushing it. Won't deal any damage, but Chengling can at least tank. And that's what Lithic Spear is, e is for, even. That needs healing food. In adventuring, as in business, you always have to seize the opportunity while it's there. Healing, defense, stalling shit. I need them. Enough procrastinating. Let's go. Life balance, but I think this is pushing it. I actually only need one of these. There's no way I'm ever normal attacking with anyone other than. Ayaka here. In adventuring, as in business, you always have to seize the opportunity while it's there. I can try taking into account and dying into my strategy. These five cards should give me enough drawing. Come on, enough procrastinating. Let's go. Honestly. And yeah, I spent too long making decks. <laughs> One deck.
What the hell is this lag? What the heck is up with Genshin as a blade? I really hate the way they force the element you're in in Inazuma and Zemaru in the first two areas uh, having Anamo and Geo is a convenience not a requirement Busted. Unlike in Tamaru and then Juno where you're practically required to have Electro and Dendro for exploration. I guess the third party controller I bought end up, ended up being clickier. <laughs> Sounding. Than the one I currently have. But that's pretty wacky. I see everything! Quietly now. Game's up. Time's over. Hey, yeah. Race you. Yeah. With sword comes shadow. <laughs> Don't blink. Hey. You don't benefit too much from Yellen's thingy. is too useful <laughs> and I don't know who other pyro and hydros I can use
I'm going the wrong way. Take it easy. I'm going the wrong way. Still. Jesus Christ. A lot of markers. Buy some supplies, why not? Oh, it's a cross, a specialty revival dishes. Good. Mm, huh? Okay. Thank you. 
I can just not worry about anything if I do this. I'm worried about convenience as of late. Oh man, he should have started off with a Joe joke. Dang it, it's too expensive. Fifteen percent my way. Where the heck are my reviving dishes? Not whatever. Was like the cheapest healing. God, I hate these flowers. Yeah, I 
No, it's been a while since I got this commission. Don't worry. Snowfall on this scale is no impediment. We can keep moving. Out. Our work's done for the day. Shall we take a stroll? For complete Add Astra Ah One hundred I don't know 
My wallet's in my bag. Yes. Okay. Right. I have to get this. What can I say? <laughs> Sister is the elemental. In a video detailing the challenges behind physical damage a while back, but one thing I forgot to mention is that physical damage falls off much faster since enemy durability scales more in that regard than the other. That's also what contributed to Grace's early success. Enemies have little physical appearance to speak of compared to now where a lot of them do, although that can be mitigated with superconduct. On the subject of superconduct, physical damage units are more restricted when it comes to team building as they're heavily dependent on a cryo and electro unit to perform at a reasonable level. Thankfully, Racer needs one part of the equation already, he simply needs a cryo unit to build the rest. And there are plenty to choose from, however, that just boils down to using either Rosaria or Diona because if they possess Ganyu, Ayaka, or Yula, they'll probably use them as their main damage dealer, not Racer. Furthermore, lack of elemental burst oriented damage and its physical damage nature causes many top level support characters to be inefficient if not potentially unuseful on him. The 5 best supports we have right now are Bennett, Shincho, Kazuha, Shogun, and Zhongli. Bennett can only be used with Razor if you don't unlock his final constellation, and most people don't. But losing out on the 15% pyro damage bonus matters a lot more than you think. Shinto is completely worthless on Razor, since his entire shtick is to catalyze a one-man hydro reactor, and physical damage does not interface with hydro at all. Kazuha is also useless on him, as his bonus elemental damage and elemental mastery is dead in the water in regards to enhancing physical damage. Shogun's introduction has orchestrated quick spot burst rotation compositions as the most effective approach to combat in this game by leaps and bounds. Razor's elemental burst doesn't do much damage, that and having her on his team would be redundant since Razor is already electro. What's ironic is that Yula and Shogun work marvelously together not only because the latter completes the necessary requirements for superconduct, but Shogun's burst amplification is better the higher your base damage is, and we just went over how Yula is as the highest in the game. That leaves us with just Zhongli. His Jade Shield reduces nearby elemental and physical resistance, so he's the only tier 2 support who can help out Razor, but that's really it. In this game, synergy is the number one metric to determine a unit's longevity, how future-proof they are as new units are released. The reason Bennett, Shanling, and Xinqiu have maintained their status as the Trinity of 4-star supports is due to the fact that they work well with just about anyone, and will continue to so long as they don't get replaced by someone who can do the same things they do but more efficiently or powerfully. The inverse is also true, but main DPS unit's viability hinges on how receptive they are to new supports and combinations. If they aren't compatible with this new top tier unit, that means everyone receives an indirect buff except them, which causes them to lag behind the rest of the cast. It's not their individual strength, not entirely anyway. It's how well they mingle with everyone else. That's the basis of how Genshin's character system functions. Razor is one of the few units in Genshin who doesn't synergize with any major support character. Not only is Hoyle trying to emphasize elemental damage over physical, but the way Razor's kit was designed just so happens to be incredibly team-unfriendly. He's a very independent 
interesting character. That was part of his appeal early on. He didn't really require supports for a tailored party to function properly, and that worked back then. It doesn't anymore. There is almost never an instance where you want to stay on one party member for more than 5 to 8 seconds at a time. Even a persistent attacker like Ganyu fires off only 3 or 4 charges with 2 arrows before switching around. Razor needs to be out for a very long time to really get going. There is also one major problem that has nothing to do with it, but affects him all the same. Lack of proper physical support is severely hindering his ability to stay relevant against the Quietly now. Yeah. So it's, it's very I see everything! Much from elemental supports, he needs to draw from physical support. Incoming! Hey! There's a whole lot of them. This is mostly <laughs> too severe Razor, as Zula's cases are big different in this regard. Her numbers are so ridiculously overinflated to compensate. Things are about to get dicey. Gotcha! Everyone hold hands! Speed of light! Yeah! Razor, on the other hand, was balanced to have more or less the same numbers as regular elemental units, which means he's slightly better than them up until those elemental units start scaling more. Speaking of scaling, something completely absent in this kit is a physical damage booster, Lightning Fangs. Boost his auto attack damage the way Noel's big ass Geosword does. It simply causes follow up electro damage. Technically, you could equate the attack speed bonus to increased auto attack damage, but he's still much slower than a sword or a spear user. A quality of life change in this regard would be if the follow up electro damage scaled off of his physical That's damage close bonus. Enough. That would give him the same type of internal power as Yuma, since he's not getting it anywhere else. Physical damage scales linearly, while elemental damage scales multiply because there's nothing that allows you to amplify physical damage beyond super conduct. Oh. That Razor is, by all accounts, fantastic for beginner and mid game players who don't have a lot of units, weapons, constellations, and such. That's partly the reason why the community didn't recognize uh, and Megan as the five stars yes. without actually being five stars that they are until several months after Genji. Anayan? Hit. 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 That's everything. Okay. On to the next. Quietly now. Hey! Speed of light! Hey! Don't blink! I was under the assumption Quicken dealt electro damage. Since release, they take a while to get going. Razor doesn't. Does this mean he can't be a worthwhile unit to me in long term? No, of course not. You can still use him to complete all of the game's existing content, and many people have. As long as you're aware that by choosing Razor as your main, you don't have a lot of ways to upgrade him in terms of support and stuff. Damage. And he has a very straightforward playstyle, which can work for or against you depending on the situation. He sort of reminds me of Sword Art Online, where everyone is a melee DPS and there's no magic or range weaponry. There's only so much you can do on Razor, a limitation you don't really encounter on any of the big name 5 stars. Though there is one thing that could potentially bring him back into the battle. Like. Zero units share a bit of weakness, <laughs> that they're almost reliant on other units to access their full potential. Whereas Razor just gotcha. swaps are also vulnerable to the magic disruption. Everyone who cares! Can you drain energy to their attacks? Hey! Just the fact that your fish has to get to watch your combos, forcing you to wake your new guys to come off. If this sort of mechanic were to grow up in frequency, it could serve as a counter to party stuff. Don't blink! Ha! 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 Quietly now. Feel free to share your opinions in the comments. For now, if you enjoyed the video, it would be awesome if you would leave a like and subscribe. Consider following me on Twitter, joining my Discord server, and checking out my other Why No Plays episodes after this one. Until next time though, thanks so much for watching. Apologies again if I sounded really bad in this video, but I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Uh, I can never seem to find a good position to sit. So I'm having back problems. As a result...
punchy. Hey, yeah. With sword comes shadow. Bust it. Here comes the catch. Hey! The Temple of Wisdom! Speed of light! Boba! Get them! Gotcha! Landscapes, culture, places to explore, and things to encounter, and it will only continue to expand as more and more of the land is made available as to discover. But unfortunately, a lot of its actual substance was only around for a limited time, when many of us believe it should have been included in the base game going forward. That brings us to our video for today. I wanted to discuss the problem with events in Genshin Impact and how even though Mihoyo gives us a lot of fun and engaging content, the way they deliver on it is not the best way to go about things. Before we continue any further, just want to give a shout out to today's sponsor. This video is brought to you by Outplay once again. It's a video capturing software on Overworld that works for every popular game such as Genshin. Players love to record and share clips in Genshin all the time, and if you're one of them, you can try this one out. Outplay automatically captures any interesting highlights during your play or allows you to record manually using the hotkey, which you can then immediately port over to your Discord server or have it uploaded to YouTube. Anywhere you feel like sharing. The app is a built-in video editor if you're feeling touching it up a bit. Legends, Valorant, Honkai Inkai, Rainbow Six Siege, and many more. If you already have Overworld, then downloading is a very easy process. Should you be interested in using Outplay, feel free to use the link on screen or in the description. Really simple but cool app that makes your great app. Boba, get them! It's good to have a response to the video, but more than that, the heck is the... More than other genres, gacha games pride themselves for better or worse on impermanence. And that impermanence takes a hold of a large majority of their content. It's just for worse. A scarcity mindset is the idea of a world that opportunities, resources, and successes are uncommon and as such must be guarded. In the context of gaming, developers utilize the scarcity mindset. Quiet now. Yeah. First, <laughs> encourage or rather pressure his clientele into remaining attached to the game for as long as possible. The second nice is to artificially inflate the immediate value of something by planting the notion that if a player fails to jump at an opportunity, another one will not come. Scarcity mindset often gets used interchangeably with the What a powerful harvest! And FOMO is what drives people to act impulsively grasping for things, even when it may not be beneficial to them because there is a limited resource or a time frame to do so. Many are already aware of the predatory nature of gacha games via their monetization systems, <laughs> but another way to administer the scarcity mindset is by intentionally suppressing the full extent of a game's experience, incentivizing players to remain committed, or in extreme cases addicted to logging on every day. Content in video games is not unlike that of a standard menu at any establishment that serves food and drink. They have their normal range of items that are available year-round, but every once in a while they toss in a special or limited time item, either to celebrate an occasion or because they feel like experimenting for a bit. As such, the point of permanent content is to give players enough of the game's experience to remain engaged to it, and at a surface level, Genshin manages to execute on this rather competently. If you were a brand new player starting out today, you would have dozens upon dozens of hours of things. You'd be surprised if the entirety of Genshin's permanent content following the advent of Sumeru spans over 200 hours. Suffice to say, you're going to be able to enjoy a lot more in one sitting than day one players have roughly two years ago. The obvious benefit of permanent content lies in the very definition of the word, permanent. The chests that spawn around the world, the puzzles you can discover, the Archon quests, character stories, hangout events, domains, and whatnot, will be a part of Genshin from now until the end of its lifetime, and it will be something every player, regardless of when they start, can look forward to. Moreover, it's important to have a healthy balance of new permanent content added to the game as time goes on, as it gives those who perhaps took a break for a few months a reason to come back and see what's new. For all intents and purposes, each new region of Tibet is not unlike an expansion you would see in other titles. A huge wave of permanent content is released all at once, similarly to how Final Fantasy XIV featured the Heavens Ward, Stormblood, Shadowbringers, and Endwalker every two years. Large expansions are a good way to reunite a player base's passion and excitement for the game that would otherwise not be possible through smaller events. But it wouldn't be wise for all new content added to the game to remain in perpetuity, as that leads to overbloating of the game's essential experience by distracting and or diluting the core part of it. Therefore, developers have to be selective with what they want permanently added to the game, since too much selection can be counterproductive. Quality over quantity. 
integral to establishing an identity. On the flip side, temporary content or events can be a fantastic way to reward existing players who regularly log on and play every day, and convince new players to try out the game for a special price. Reading large-scale expansions understandably takes a lot of time, so developers can keep the fire burning with smaller events here and there. Genshin's flagship events can usually be identified by whether or not they provide a crown of insight as a reward, a rare item that is used to rank up character talents from level 9 to 10. There's usually one crown event every version. The benefit of these events is that they either promote a new area or feature, such as a 3 round scheme we offer, giving a place a reason to check out the new Enkanomia, or to breathe new life into existing areas, like how Shadows of Mid Snowstorms brought players back to Dragon's Spine after having spent most of the summer and fall in Mozuma. Something I think Genshin does really well is expand on the world building with these events and make the characters feel more intertwined with them than they're about to that. I loved how we got to see Kree and Albedo travel to Inazuma as tourists for the Zephyr of the Violent Garden, or how we got to see Ito and Shinobu travel to Rima during hidden dreams in the depths. It's a nice touch, especially since we really don't see characters wandering around in the overworld from day to day. The events can also be used to provide a steady flow of valuable resources that wouldn't be good for the game's economy if it were readily available in the base game. And this applies to even single player, despite not having general problems. As mentioned before, we have the crown of insight, while it would be nice for these to be unlimited in supply so we don't have to pick and choose which characters to max out and just max all of them. They are a great way to encourage players to check out those events, as there's no other way to get more of them outside of that. But events do come with their own drawbacks. While temporary bits of enjoyment are great for granting a bit of extra indulgence to the players, certain aspects should not be exclusive to those events. Furthermore, temporary content is like dessert. They exist in the country of course, but they should be open to species. But also, they have more parts of the society of course. Boba, get them! Cut to the chase! Things are about to get dicey. Incoming! Hey! One should remain mutually exclusive from one another. It's a very delicate balance of the game between the temporary and one should become friends. Whether it's okay for this new event to remain in the game even after the event period, or if it should be taken out. And this is where we encounter the first problem with events in the game should impact. Lately, there appears to be a far greater emphasis placed on events than the base game, even though it really should be the other way around. I can't speak for what lasting features will be introduced along with Sumeric when some writing this before it's officially in the game. But throughout version 2's nine events, something has been made abundantly clear. A lot of them could have stayed even after their event period was over. It should be clarified that most events are designed around a specific occasion. For example, in other games, especially anime ones, there's usually a summer event, and with it comes skins or alternative characters where humans are wearing swimsuits, or there might be a holiday event where everyone's wearing Christmas stuff. It actually wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for a player to run into a winter games event in the middle of July. In that regard, events like the Lantern Rite celebrating Chinese New Year in the Yue or the summer events in the Golden Apple Archipelago should remain in their respective seasons. But there are some events that look like they can very easily fit into the base game without being intrusive to player experiences, or in some cases, not including them, or at least a part of them, can be extremely detrimental to the experience of some players who weren't actively playing when the event was running. The most egregious offender of this was one of the game's first flagship events, Unreconciled Stars, in version 1.1. While it first appeared to look like a regular coin shop, event in which you're going to materials to trade in for standard fair like talent floats, essential materials, more and whatnot. The quest line itself had very plot relevant details related to the greater lore surrounding to that, including the reveal of Scaramouche, one of the Fatui Harbingers, who you wouldn't run into in the main storyline until a year later. Meaning if you didn't play during Unreconciled Star's event period, not only did you miss out on some meaningful screen time for official, but also a very critical revelation. The coin shop part of it could have been dismissed, but something that revelatory should not be a limited really time thing. <laughs> about it, a player could miss that entire segment and still follow the Alcon storyline, but that doesn't detract from the point that that kind of content should have been permanent to the There are also the two dragon spine events with Albedo, explaining why I spent so much time on there and its connection with the dragon that was buried beneath. Again, technically not all too relevant to the main plotline, but it explains a very important piece of narrative background, and is really the only reason you would care about dragon spine in the first place outside of it being another area to find chests and whatnot. Fortunately for future events, they integrated the focal point of every event into the main storyline. Two examples are The Crane Returns on the Wind and Perilous Trail, which are interlude chapters, the former leading to the reconstruction of the Jade Chamber after it was destroyed during the end of the Liyue arc, and Spoilers. the latter the Chasm and Labyrinth underneath. While the event rewards are no longer available, you can still access the story part of the Wait for my signal. They feature very, very important backstories for a lot of characters, so good on them for doing so.
That being said, outside of events, there really isn't a whole lot of reason to explore entire areas in Genshin. For instance, Enkonomia is an entire dungeon deep beneath the Sankonomia Shrine. There are still so many places for us to explore! From exploring the area to gain access to the Coral Defenders who Dragon Hair's False Fin, players don't have any real external motivation to go back into that area and explore the other parts of it. At least, I charge a higher rate to meet outside the office. Even though it was really long. It made you explore pretty much every nook and cranny of the place, and leveling up the focus of box to be able to explore further was a cool feature. And I have an essence, actual team have no substance to them besides the actual them grow and all. Events. By extension, there really isn't a whole I lot thought. to do with the base game other than whatever event is happening at the moment, and that usually confines you to one area. Another issue with Genshin's events is that it's a disappointing waste of effort on the events. Some of the game's most engaging combat scenarios took place in the temporary dungeons until they seem to do some tandem with events. As ridiculous as it sounds, I actually kind of like the elemental who's still back. It meant that Sirius is the only event to this day when co-op was mandatory, and the only reason people didn't like it was because it cost resin to participate, but the game for itself was not even have that. It was actually kind of fun. Considering the location where it took place being a very big landmark on the world map, but nothing really happening there otherwise, I don't see why they couldn't have left it there as an introductory tutorial on multiplayer. There were a ton of gameplay events that presented combat in a more nuanced way, stuff that made players you think how they had to approach every dungeon instead of picking their strongest units and destroying everything. Bloodrun Warriors, Legend of the Vagabond Sword, Perilous Trail, Three Rocks Gateway Offering, Bible Crystal, one of my biggest complaints about combat in Genshin has always been the lack of variety in scenarios. These events created those scenarios, and it's a shame that some form of each of them were never reinstated in the base game. Personally, I would much rather play Labyrinth Warriors to find my speed points instead of ley lines, or I would love to do the Perilous Trail to find weapons and such materials. Perhaps, if at all possible, they could have been sourced to the game content for players. It feels like such a waste of time and effort to make copies of Dutch available for like three weeks, only to never be seen again. At the same time, however, it wouldn't be very prudent for me to make every single event area and or domain in the early edition. Upgraded the rewards or did away with them entirely. Feature creep happens very often and leads to a lot of things feeling very interesting. <laughs> if there are too many things you have to do, it can be overwhelming for players. Last thing I would have to complete whatever event is happening right now, but also whatever event is going on before. On one hand, you can create a treasure. One way to draw your target out of hiding. But on the other, having every single event be permanent basically means new players won't be able to catch up without playing four to five hundred hours of content first. That's also not good. The general nature of events is what makes it so appealing and so special. It's 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 for granted. If we have the same Christmas event every year, why even bother doing it again the next time? And by no means trying to argue that all events, dungeons, and domains should be permanently added to the game that would oversaturate and dilute the nation's experience. While game developers should always try to acquire as many new prospective players as possible, they'll also be holding to the existing player base. Who wants to stick around? You have to find that middle ground. The primary strategy that other gadgets employ are event reruns or a set rotation, where old events or challenges are routinely cycled through instead of all of them slamming you at once. Genshin already does this with banners. On top of the new character, they usually have a second banner showcasing a rerun, but event reruns in conjunction with new events would be nice as well, especially the ones that give weapons or items like the Dodo Quartails, Festering Desire, and Cinnabar Spindle to name a few. To prevent players from having too many resources, they can make it so you can only get the rewards once. One of the best storyline events was the Golden Apple Archipelago featuring Queen and Chief and Barbara, which players have been planning for a rerun for. To everyone's surprise, the Archipelago comes back with an entirely new event attached to it, so they sort of made good on their promise of bringing it back. I don't know how many of you watched Kazuka's video on why Genshin Impact won't last, but he criticized the Lantern Light rerun for featuring an entirely different storyline than the one that came before. While I agree with some parts of that argument, I'm also in the school of thought that continually updated games are not Netflix shows. They're not meant to be replayable from start to finish on demand whenever a player wants. The whole idea of these games is for players to play playing them. Following the world's continuity as if they themselves are living up to them, that's part of the experience of updating games. If I were to go back to an old MMO like, say, a Maple Story, I can't expect to go all the way back to the glory days of Remake Bang and play from then to now. That would be utterly nonsensical, so the toilet isn't obligated to treat Genshin like that. All the same, they're not getting more focused in the main course of the game, choosing instead to focus primarily on dessert. There are some events that should be time exclusive, because they pertain to the world's seasonality, holidays, etc., or they're just extraneous one of the gameplay elements like the mechanic is or the game dreaming. Nice, sure, but if we had to pick and choose, we could make do without them. There are also events that would really serve to enhance the experience of the game if there were permanent additions. And yet, not just for the purposes of that game, Hello content, there. but overall enjoyability for more casual and hardcore players alike. Anyways, the video is getting very long, so I'll end it off here. If you can choose three events of old to do add to the base 
scheme, what would they be and why? Let me know in the comments down below. For now, if you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe. Consider following me on Twitter at Farsfair, joining my Discord server, and checking out my other discussion videos if you haven't yet. Until next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Yeah, I was wait. I was looking for this. I'll watch it later when I'm. Today we picked five of our favorites that we're most excited to try out. Now, Lucky and I have an extensive navigating the world that we hope to try. But today we're going to talk about the five that we're most excited for. Some of which you may have seen us try on the show, and some of which you probably heard us mention in some of our videos prior to this. So today we're going to look at those five game systems, we're going to talk about what excites us about them, and whether or not we've played them, or had any experience with them currently, or if we're just excited to dive in and try them out. The recommendations today will include things that really, really branch out from maybe what you're familiar with, but also include some really great alternatives of your program not to discuss, so let's get real so kicking things off, let's talk about one that we have tried on the show, Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu is an investigative horror game where you take the role of an investigator. Now this investigator can be a number of different types of person, but either way, you're trying to solve a mystery in your games of Call of Cthulhu. In these games, mystery takes the forefront, and combat is not going to be your first option brings a little bit more of great realism to the game. Well, you try to solve mysteries surrounding horrible monsters and Lovecraftian elements from cosmic horror. The notion of your character's sanity is front and center in Call of Cthulhu, because as your character investigates mystery that might begin innocuous at first, you will discover the horrible truth of Well, the researcher must be so confused right now, because we're talking to no one. As you are physically threatened, by forces beyond the cosmos that humankind can never fully understand or comprehend. The, the system is actually surprisingly lightweight and easy to learn. It's a D100 based system where your character needs to roll under your attribute in order to succeed. <laughs> the keeper or the game master is able to modify this by having you roll under half your score. Call of Cthulhu is wonderful Making because real it's entirely fun. played in the there is no real need for miniatures or maps or terrain, although, because it has this investigative focus, there's a real great opportunity. There's tons of great handouts and archival footage. And one of the things I love about Call of Duty is that you can change the setting very easily from the default 1920s United States. We ran our game in 1990s small town Ontario, Canada, and there are so many packs of Call of Duty. So, poor Paimon. Everyone just makes fun of her, even us. There have been many different iterations on Call of Duty to give you that feeling from any, anything from something that is very tightly inspired by the original works of H.P. Lovecraft and uh, some other contemporary writers, or you could run something that's more akin to the X File system, or even if you want to pick up Pulp Cthulhu and punch Cthulhu in the face, you absolutely can. 
Call of Cthulhu is one of the most fun RPGs that I've played in recent history. And actually, if you do want to check out our one shot that we did of Call of Cthulhu, you can check that out right up over there. This one shot was really fun and featured our player Jill and myself with Monty as the keeper. And it was an absolute blast, and I really like diving into the sort of more hey. real world nature of just playing a author rather than yeah. anything heroic. I was an author trying to find his lost manuscript and looking for a missing friend. And that was enough to get me going, and it made the decisions much more interesting. In a lot of RPGs I've played, it's so easy to say I pick up my sword and run at the dragon, but in Call of Cthulhu, you have to think very carefully, because you are a fleshy human. If you get shot once, I die. And bringing that into it, I want to eat something.
was my first foray into sci-fi horror in a tabletop RPG setting. It is a brutally scary game where you can play for one night or you can play an expansive campaign. Either way, be careful because the monsters in this game, sort of like in Call of Cthulhu, are not to be trifled with. If you get into a combat scenario, as the movies might suggest, your best bet is to hide, run, or find an airlock to shove that alien in there and blast them out into space and hope for the best. Freely Publishing is another absolute juggernaut in the role-playing game space, and they have so many other games that are really wonderful that are very high, highly regarded at any award -winning. As a last note on Alien RPG, if you've only seen maybe a couple of the movies and haven't really dived into the lore of the world, I will say that there is a lot of political intrigue, corporate espionage, and a whole bunch of very interesting things that you actually get to play around with in this setting. If you're doing a longer campaign, it moves far beyond just humans versus aliens and really moves into the idea, which is present in all of the alien films, of what do humans want to do with these aliens and why do they keep making terrible choices that end up with a lot of people dead. Now, speaking of conspiracies, darkness, but maybe stepping a little bit away from the horror, is a game that I am super excited about and have been incredibly inspired by, but haven't yet had the chance to really do. And that is John Harper's Blaze in the Dark. Blaze in the Dark is the game that gets heists right. This game has a really cool sort of steampunky dark fantasy setting behind it that is a little bit more um, maybe Victorian-esque in, in, in its background. But it can be played in a variety of different settings because what's remarkable about Blaze in the Dark is that your characters play as a band of thieves, criminals, assassins, bandits, whatever you want to find them as. You've got various playbooks and it allows you to kind of build up your hideout, build up your crew, and plan your heists. Whether that is stealing the MacGuffin, assassinating, collecting blackmail, whatever that is. And Blaze in the Dark accomplishes this with some really, really brilliant mechanics. It's a d6-based system that uses a dice pool. So basically, you are attempting to do a skill that your character is. You're going to be rolling a number of dice, and when, and if you get a six on any of them, you succeed. Um, and if you get a four or five, it's a partial success. In other words, you don't get anything higher than that. You do more dice give you chances, but different things can influence how many dice you're going to get. To I love these sixes, so they're I, I love them. Oh, yeah, it, it is. These the, the sixes are great. And so I really like that element of the system. Well, but I think what is brilliant about this is that this is the system that really made clocks a big deal for progress clocks are kind of this idea that track successes and failures up and I've integrated some clocks in a sort of modified way of skill challenges. Um, but I think the thing about this that makes it super do a heist in Blaze the Dark. Gets past the planning phase that normally accomplishes heists. So normally in, in many other systems when your characters are planning a heist, you spend session after session after session, everyone sitting down around the table planning a heist in. Blaze in the Dark, like a movie, you get to the heist and then you have flashbacks of the planning phase. So it actually gives a mechanic where a player character is like, oh no! You come down the hallway and a guard is there with a gun, and you feel like, I'm flashing back. It turns out I rigged all the weapons the guards had. And now you can't do that, there's a limit to how many times you as a player get to do that, but I love that, that idea because it allows you to get action, really feel the tension of the heist, and I think the fantasy setting is really, really 
kind of. Blades in the Dark is another one that, like, Apocalypse World is powered by the Apocalypse. We also now have the Forged in the Dark moniker, which has given rise to games like Band of Blades, which replaces the Band of Thieves and Heists of um, Blades in the Dark with a mercenary band fighting for survival, Black Company style. I am super excited to play this game because I like military fantasy, and um, I think I think this one might this one might be for, for me. I have a lot of ideas for me. I will just throw in that I'm excited to try both of these. And hearing Monty wax rhapsodically continuously over the last <laughs> few years about these games has made me even more excited to try them out. I'm going to throw in here one that we don't have at the table currently. But going with my sci-fi horror theme, I have recently backed the Kickstarter for Mothership, which, similar to Alien RPG, implements sci-fi horror and a sanity and stress system, which I think is really, really cool, but is a little bit more rules light than the Alien RPG and lends itself more I'm going to continue this some other time. I want to do something else right now. Of game style. I'm excited to get my hands on it and try it out and see where that one goes. If you can't tell, I'm a huge fan. If I'm going to pick one genre that I'm the most excited about, it's sci-fi horror, and I really can't wait to dive into those worlds. And I also want to get, before we get to our last pick, I also 